Can you hear me? You still have, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Okay, we are live now. So, here we go. So, welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tomas Avila, and I am here with two very good friends who I'm going to introduce in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, just want to let you know that this is the fourth of a series that I started running at, uh, at the beginning of the month, uh, which I titled uh, Latino Leadership 2020, Honoring Our Past, Transforming Our Present, and Leading Our Future. And the purpose of these conversations is to get into the uh, conversations about the successes that we have had in the Latino community within the last 20 years. In particular, I decided to focus in two, the years 2000 and 2020. And my reasoning behind it was because that's the year, uh, the period of time where according to a book that I read uh, many years ago, uh, Latinos in New England, there was a chapter titled Gaining Power in Rhode Island. And what it talks about is the process that Latinos went through in Rhode Island after many years uh, of the, our ancestors and individuals who came here many years ago, it started, uh, you know, the process of empowering the Latino community, opening doors, uh, creating uh, institutions to provide services to the Latino community. And then in, in the 90s, uh, very much uh, there was, uh, a flow of individuals coming into the community. And the way I describe it is there was a score of young Latinos coming out, out of the colleges and universities and they were hungry and their hunger was to change Rhode Island and change the world. And in that process of trying to change Rhode Island, they created an impact that I don't even think many of them realize what they achieve, but they achieve the changing of the Latino community, the visioning of the Latino community, and most important, the changing of Rhode Island. So today I have two very good friends who I met back way back then, and we are gonna share their contributions in that change, in that visioning, but most importantly, the impact that they still have in the community and professionally. I have with me uh, my good friend, uh, Melba de Peña. Hi, Melba. Hi, Tomas. And, so <laughs> and Victor Capellan. Hi, Victor. Hello, Tomas. So it's good to have you here and thank you for accepting to be part of these conversations. Because as I mentioned to you, you both have contributed many, 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 in many ways, shape or forms, you know, whether it's political, uh, educational, professional, uh, your contributions are, have been very significant to the community and to the state of Rhode Island. And I even dare say nationally, because uh, you both have gone beyond the borders of Rhode Island. So I am going to give you each a uh, few minutes to introduce yourself and, you know, welcome. Who want to go first? I guess this lady is first. So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So thank you, Tomas, for, for that introduction. Thank you so much for doing this. It's, you know, it's amazing how uh, just as you invited me, I started thinking a lot about some of the things that uh, Victor and I were able to do back in college and throughout the years. Then, you know, it's been a nice opportunity to think through some of those things and to reflect on those. Um, I don't do that very often, but uh, just to think about that young group of students that were coming from, I, I think some of our friends used to call it the, um, what was the name that they had Victor for us? The, that we were living in the, um, in a country club because oh. they thought, they really thought that it was just, you know, 
so nice to live on campus, be away from the community. But in reality, uh, Victor and I and some of our friends really miss the community. Anywhere from our family, the food that we were used to, uh, to then growing to be these adults that really wanted to be back and give back to the community. But um, there were some sacrifices that we made back then that was worth it, uh, but we really wanted to come back and, and give back, so. Victor? Uh, Victor thank you, Damas. Yeah. Um, thank you for, for the invitation. <clears throat> and thank you for, for really organizing not only tonight's event, but also the whole series that, that you've been doing. I've been able to catch a couple of the others live and then saw some of the others on, on YouTube. And really, I think your contribution to uh, documenting sort of the, the history um, of the Latino community here in Rhode Island um, has been uh, terrific. So thank you. And, and thanks for always um, including us as part of your projects and as part of your work. And um, like Melba said, I think this is a, was a good opportunity, especially in light of everything that's happening in, in the world right now to take a step back, to think, to reflect, and to really look at um, where we've been um, with the lens of sort of, you know, how do we go forward? Um, what are the kinds of things that we can, you know, continue to contribute any which way that we can. But yeah, no, we, we started off um, really uh, trying to survive, I think is the, the best way to put it. I think we needed to find ways, um, especially, you know, when we were at, at URI um, to sort of maintain that Latino identity, to maintain some kind of self identity. And so that's what the drive was. And so for me, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here at the Mas. Um, and, um, you know, I think you, you said by way of introduction um, right now, just um, Victor Capellan, you know, um, very happy with my two, soon to be two year old son. And um, that's sort of my main motivation these days. So um, really excited to, um, to, to be able to think back to the last 20, 30 years. Um, so thank you for, for giving us the opportunity, Tomas. And Victor, I like that you mentioned your son that, you know, two years old, because that was part of what we were doing is to make it better for the next generations coming. And, you know, you, you and I both have children now, um, one each, of course, uh, but that was part of what we wanted to do. How do we create that community that uh, will be uh, better for our children than it was for us? And thank you both. Uh, and uh, and definitely, you know, that's that's what it was. It's like, you know, it's amazing because we engage in a lot of things when we are young. And because we are young ourselves, we we don't have the vision to think of the next generation because we are the now generation. But really, that's what it is. Everything that we do is for our children, our future children, our future families. And it is to bring a better world than we had. Even if we had a, a good world within ourselves and our upbringing, but we always thinking better. But Melba, you mentioned the word country club, and that's a word that I used to hear a lot in that time. And you know what I find very interesting about both of you is that you could have decided to stay in the country club. You know, you could have decided to be administrators, professors, or whatever you wanted in, in that country club. But instead, you both decided, and you both had that hunger of wanting to come back, and you did come back. Why did you decide to, you alluded to it, but what, what really drove you to come back and leave the country club behind? Yeah, so, you know, one thing that people may know or not know, I'm not quite sure, but when Becca and I were in college, we were experiencing very similar situations as what the country is going through right now in terms of, you know, student of color really feeling welcome and part of the community at URI. And what, what we did was we worked hard and got involved in the student organizations um, 
like the Latin American Student Association, LASDA, uh, both of which we were presidents of, and then created uh, a, an environment for, in my case, for women to feel welcome and to be part of a community by, the, you know, by founding the Señorita Latinas Unidas, which also has a uh, counterpart um, in the uh, male side of things. And, and, and Victor was actually the one that started all of that. And so we, even back then, um, were fighting all of these things that are currently going on right now. And one of the things that I learned early on was, I think a better approach to work with the administration, to work with the people that are in power. Uh, and, um, and I think we felt very supported with the administration. Like I right now uh, work with Dr. Carruthers, who was the president at the time. And I mean, a very busy person, he took time to meet with us. He took time to listen to our concerns. And so we began to feel that by working hard, by really having a vision and really working with people that we have this potential to change, not only do our eye, but to change the world. You know, we were idealistic, we were young people back then. And so I think that it all started when Victor decided to start coming into the community. And also we were having uh, conferences at, at URI and having some of our community leaders like Patricia Martinez, Betty Bernard, Jose Gonzalez, we felt supported by them. And then we began to believe what every young person believes and should believe wow, we could do this and we could change the world and decided to branch out. But I, 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 I had to share this with Victor. When Victor came back and said, you know, I think I need to go work with Kiskeya in Action and Chief Bob. We were like, what? What are you talking about? And so it was a lot of conversation, a lot of planning um, back on campus, um, really putting everything into perspective and deciding that we worked hard on campus, but we, we also had a obligation to go back to the community and pay it forward um, and do the same thing that we were doing on campus, but now back uh, uh, in Providence in Rhode Island. Yeah, Tomas, let me, let me pick up right there with Melba, um, sort of um, a, a very shared history, shared experience. Um, and we were playing sort of this inside and outside game at URI. We definitely had, you know, an opportunity to meet with the president, sit and, you know, put our demands in front of uh, President Carruthers and the administration who supported us. But we are also not afraid to sort of voice our concerns, to organize, to be able to, you know, create a network that was much broader than, than just a group of students on campus. And that's when, um, you know, began to really connect with the Latino community um, across the state. And you know, some of the names that, that Melba mentioned, you know, Jose Gonzalez, Patricia Martinez, you add, you know, Olga Noguera, you add, you know, Margarita Cepeda, um, even in his youth at the time, Juan Pichardo, um, another young person doing some of the work um, through CCRI. I think we, we began to develop this, this um, network and then through the work of coming back home um, and finding sort of a place to organize with Quisqueya en Acción, we said, okay, we can do the same kind of work that we were doing on campus now with a larger community um, in Providence. And so became very active um, with Quisqueya en Acción that then um, led us into, you know, launching a campaign, um, led us into connecting with Jose Gonzalez and supporting the, the beginning of Latino Dallas for Scholars and, you know, working with Dr. Rodriguez and creating um, real packing with, you know, our current uh, Madam Secretary, right? Secretary Gorbea to, to create, um, you know, at the time um, they were having these, um, these uh, suburb parties, right? To try and connect people, again, not just in Providence, but also all across the state that wanted to do this. Some of them had more resources. So we were like, we all need to bring this together. And that was the, the, the birth of, you know, uh, Latino Dallas Scholars. That was the birth of Real PAC, of the Civic Fund. Um, you know, we, we really sort of, um, got the advantage also by, of being mentored 
by a lot of people who had been doing this work and we just joined with them. We did not say, you know, it's our turn now. Let us, we were like, you know, we want to be a part of this and yes, we want to lead and yes, we have ideas, but we also knew at the time that we needed that mentoring and they were all very, very giving of their time and of their experience. Um, and, and a lot of times stepped aside for us. Um, I mean, I remember Margarita Cepeda, you know, my first few activities in Quisqueya and Acción, she's like, no, no, I'm not talking anymore. You are, you go up there in front. So, so we got that space as well from people that became mentors to us, which is critical for us now to be able to do for, for others. <clears throat> and uh, thank, thank you both for sharing. And definitely does that play a, a big role in, the, in the, that mentoring, but at the same time, that desire to give back uh, Melba, you mentioned something quite interesting. Uh, you said, you know, back then the country was going uh, to, through a, a lot of what we're going through today. And, you know, and that's what, where I find the value of looking back because uh, when we are in the present, we usually think, oh, this is the worst period, this is, but others have lived different periods. And I agree with you because back in the 90s, you know, I remember 96, uh, actually, when Victor ran, when immigration was, hot, you know, anti-immigration was, you know, like, and what it does eventually, it wakes up, it wakes up the communities. I remember when I met with Victor. Actually, uh, we met at URI, and I was there for uh, the initial first class of CLDI. And I remember spending lunch talking about what was going on. Loretta had just won in, uh, back in California, you know, all these changes. But at the same time, you guys came into the mix of all of these things happening. And it's interesting because so now, fast forward 20 years, we have COVID. COVID is challenging everything that has been done. And that's one of my subtitles to these conversations is that we gain power. We Ele we, uh, between 20, uh, 2000 and 2020, we have elected 40 Latinos, 20, 24 are serving right now, 20s, needless to say, you know, have gone by. But with all of that, COVID came and the same inequities that we were fighting way back then, uh, now we are confronting and, and COVID highlighting. So all of that to say that, uh, needless to say, whether it's 20 years uh, ago or 40 years ago, you know, it seems like that saying is so true, that the more things change, the more they remain the same. So again, and thank you for bringing it because, so how do you see moving ahead from where we are today? I've started Anyone? questions before, so I think it's just right now. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, Tomas, I think, you know, when we look back, we were looking at, you know, Prop 187 that was just um, coming out. You know, we had been, um, I remember as I was graduating from, from college, those were the LA riots. Um, so it was really a time where we were needing to sort of re redefine um, sort of what the, the, environment was like and, and one point that I don't want to miss is that you know part of the learning um, during those times for us was just also how do we reach out to other communities and and connect with them um, and I think you know I, I want to credit you Tomas and, and, um, and Jim Vincent uh, from the NAACP because the two of you really spent a lot of time talking to us about sort of the the lessons learned the sacrifices the struggles of the um, black community, not only um, in Rhode Island, but both of you sort of brought a perspective from Boston and um, really began to look at, you know, this is again, how do you broaden, how do you become inclusive and not just looking at your own little part of the world or your own very narrow view of the world. Um, and, and that's where, you know, we then began to look at nationally, well, we weren't the only ones going through this in, in Rhode Island, right? Um, and we began to connect with folks across the country, especially through our work with the Dominican American National Roundtable um, and connecting with uh, especially people in New York. Um, one of the leaders of that movement is now Congressman Adriano Espaillat, who took us under his wing in many ways and sort of, you know, helped create sort of this national agenda um, that focused, you know, on, on immigration, but also that really looked at, you know, if we wanted to have lasting change and lasting impact, 
was around um, education. And, and Melba said it earlier, you know, and this was really, I think, the driving force to when we began this, it's like, how do we leave this place better than we found? How do we create the conditions for future uh, young people? Um, how do we make sure that, um, you know, we're making some kind of contribution, but we weren't thinking, you know, that this was going to be 20 years from now. We were looking at, you know, whoever our friends were um, that, that we saw having the same struggle. Um, we leaned a lot on, on each other. Um, but the main point is how, how did we build that network? And it was just, again, by being inclusive, by being bigger than, we knew this was bigger than us. We were not anything special. We were just a part of something that was happening and we needed to do our part during that time. Um, and, and I wanna highlight that, <clears throat> you know, when, when we came into that work, something that was happening you know, here in Providence, um, if you look back at 1993, um, in that period of like those four years or so, um, that's when the probe report came out, right? That that really gave the first report on Providence Public Schools. Um, and we, we were um, lucky enough to have somebody like Superintendent Deanna Lamb come into uh, Rhode Island. I know personally, um, that was one of the changing moments for me, both personally and professionally. But what she did was, you know, and I remember her saying this at an event at the Rhode Island Foundation, that we needed a revolution, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think people were not ready for that at the time for whatever reason. The conditions certainly warranted it um, back then and still do today. Um, but it was that kind of thinking. Those were the people that we were gravitating towards, people that knew that things could be better and had to be better, um, so that's, that's sort of what we just kept on focusing. And whatever we did was just like, how do we contribute to make it better? Yeah, and the, the other thing that I think is important to, to address is that when this group of young people uh, came from URI to Providence, we did confront a little bit of resistance and a little bit of, um, you know, those, the power structure that was in place at the time was saying, wait a minute, what's going on? Who are you and what are you doing here, right? And I think it's a testament to the strength and the vision of what as a group we were bringing that we didn't give up. It was difficult for a little bit there. And I think once again, because now with the older one in the community, right? It was important to have those individuals that were willing to guide us. Uh, you know, I remember uh, when we were URI, had we seen this um, headline in, in, in the paper, FASTA Jack, right? That always stayed with me. And that was a group of individuals. I don't know if it was uh, Patricia Martinez or uh, I don't know, Tomas, you, or one of the ones that, but it was in response to everything that we were going through on campus. It was one thing after the other, where it was very clear for us that we were being sent a message that we were not quite welcome on campus. Um, at the time, we were a very small number of students of color on campus. And really having that support from our community and really understanding that what we were experiencing was also part of the bigger picture of what was going on in California, what was going on in Massachusetts, what was going on in other states. And having people share that with us, I think it was very helpful for us to understand that we were at a point in history where the depending on what we did, uh, the next generation will have a better community. And um, we went from, you know, being active in Quisqueya Nacion to really being part of Chispa, Victor running for yeah. office and all of us being part of that. And then one election after the other, but then really understanding education is important, right? And economic development is important. And how do we add all of these things into the mix and create that community, right? And so I think 
there was a lot of strategy that went along with these conversations, but without the support of uh, people like you, Tomas, and some of the ones that we've mentioned, it would have been a lot difficult to, to get to where we, where we got. And, you know, and, uh, and thank you both. And, and again, thank you for, because again, we are relieving a lot of those uh, issues that, you know, you both leave uh, 20 years ago in, while in college. And now we have to re, re envision, you know, we need to look forward 20 years into the future. But now we have 20 years of experience, live and, you know, and achieve success and changing many things, you know, but in particular changing Rhode Island. It, you know, so now we have, again, COVID, we have the death of Mr. Floyd, and all the, the country is, is in shambles very much, uh, you know, and, but again, um, the other reason I wanted to speak with you both, because it's, it is the youth that make the impactful changes into the future. You know, I read many years ago that if you want to change the world or if you want to change anything fast, give it to the young people. Mm -hmm. And again, you, you both were the young people of 20 years ago, and now you are the senior, but, you know, not so high senior, but you know, you are the mature Sorry, individual. Yeah, Tomas. Now we have to know. Tomas, <laughs> cuidado. <laughs> Oh, you both job. <laughs> now, now we have the millennials who are done a great job because of what you, you both and many others built. You know, you built a base uh, of, in, of making a difference, of improving Rhode Island, improving, you know, many of the policies. And, and again, it is so now visioning into, you know, 20 years from now, I, despite what's going on, I am very optimistic. And I'm optimistic because, again, when I met you both, you were very young, but you were driven, and you were, and you drove change. And that's what we need to understand also, that despite of how bad things are now, things are going to change. These things are going to improve, and 20 years from now, we're going to be having a different conversation. Let's get and into politics. One part of Tomas, that I think I, yeah. I, I do really want to address, and that is that, um, of course, this conversation needs to start sort of like where Victor and I, our experience. But there were so many people before us that yes. were doing this work, right? And so when we talk about the arts, right, we think of people like Margarita Cepeda, uh, Victor Mendoza, that were doing a lot of work in trying to get the community to a point uh, of unity, because at that time, it was Puerto Ricans, the Dominicans, the Colombians, right? And so trying to unite that. And then when we look at economic development in business, the, the Mendes family has been such an important part of our culture, of our community. And you know, business mm -hmm. development and entrepreneurship and all of that. When we think of education and nonprofit organization, you know, all of those elements really set everything up for us to be successful. Um, again, it was our responsibility to then do the same for the next generation, right? Um, and to make sure that we're there for advice for mentoring mm. uh, as needed. We don't need to impose ourselves and say, this is the way we were doing it and this is the way that it needs to be done. But I I, I am a strong believer. Um, I have a low profile. I, I, but any of the younger um, group that is, that is working out in the community right now can reach out and I'm happy to share um, whatever knowledge I've been able to um, to acquire it throughout the years, but understanding that multi-generational trajectory, I think it's important uh, for our community specifically. Um, Lidia Riveras and Tony uh, were very important in sort of like those political action committees that were created before Rio PAC. Um, it's beautiful to be able to look at that history and understand how it works. Yeah. And totally agree. And you know, uh, 
and they used to say in our idea that you know every generation stands on the shoulders of the previous generation, mm -hmm. and that's what make allow us to envision and make a better world because we really don't have to start from where the previous generation started. And, and definitely there's so many individuals. And that's why I say that, you know, very much the, I talk about evolution because that's what life is. It's an evolution, you know, uh, our ancestors started and then, you know, needless to say, eventually keeps evolving from one generation to the next. And before you know it, we have a present that's a lot better than their present. But if they had not started it, we wouldn't have been able to get where we are. And, and definitely uh, everybody, you know, um, no, nobody starts from zero. We know that there's such, there's such, such things as starting from zero. Even when we are young, we, we think that, oh, you know, I'm going to start from zero and I'm going to start my own thing. No, you're starting from where the previous generation left it or brought it to and then you build from there so we never in life start from ground zero it's just like i don't believe you know those individuals who say i made myself without the help no no matter what we always have to thank those who came before us and those who prepared the vote for us so um i wanted to get into politics because again that was like the next step that you guys took, uh, you decided to challenge the political system. And me, uh, <clears throat> Melba alluded to it. Uh, I remember back then, you know, and from what I hear still on, it was like, oh, you gotta wait your turn. Oh, you know, who are you? And yeah, why you wanna challenge me? Oh, why can't you wait? Why can't... A lot of, you know, a lot of excuses as to why not allow you the young generation to run or to challenge. Uh, but you guys took, kind of, I mean, the typical approach of the young, you either work with me or you work against me. And very much that's the, the, uh, the decision that, you know, you made and you both, you know, are, along with everybody else that you mentioned, but in particular, his in action, took politics to a, a different level. Tell us about that. So um, but one of the things, Tomas, you know, I, and I, I told this story so many times, um, I learned so much, right, from my, my run in 96 and then in 98. Um, you know, we were just a group of young people that were idealistic, that thought that politics could be a way that we could make a difference. Um, and that's why we sort of got involved in, in, and did it. Um, and and I have to tell you that, <clears throat> you know, uh, when when we were doing the um, all of the plants and everything, it was one of those things like we were just making it up, right? We were figuring it out. Um, but then people sort of believed in, yeah, this is a way that we can um, change things for the better. Um, and I was lucky enough to sort of be initially out front, but there were people, you know, uh, Anastasia Williams, Luis, uh, Luisa Ponte, um, Juan Francisco. Um, all these people that had run before. So again, we didn't, we didn't start from ground zero. There were people that had laid some groundwork before that we were building on and we were learning from their successes, from their mistakes um, and then making our own bunch of mistakes ourselves. Um, but, but I remember, you know, sort of my campaign team um, coming together and I was just like, we were just like also eager to, to do this work. And, you know, it included uh, certainly Melva, Juan Pichardo, uh, Gonzalo Cuervo, Ernesto Figueroa, Angel Taveras, included Patricia, uh, uh, Patricia Cross, and it included so many people that, you know, when, you know, we all went our own ways and, and did some great things, but we had sort of that in common, so many of us coming together and, and running. Um, and I remember, you know, one of the times when we were saying, well, we have to start door knocking. We were like, okay, so that's what you got to do. We start door knocking. And you remember, Tomas, you went with me on one of these on, on Montgomery Avenue, actually. I remember, oh. um, I think you probably still have the notes. I'm sure you do somewhere um, <laughs> from, from that walk. And now I know that you're supposed to go door knock to where there are registered voters that are likely voters in your party. <laughs> We were like, no, no, we got to knock on every door because what if there's somebody there that's not registered to vote? We have to register them to vote. What if somebody's not a citizen? Well, we have to talk to them about becoming a citizen. 
well, you know, by the time we got to the fifth house, you know, it was already nighttime and we had already done five houses instead of going to. But again, our mission was different. Our mission was like, you know, we have to make sure that, yes, we wanted to get people out to vote. We also wanted to register people to vote. We also wanted to make sure people were becoming citizens so they could vote. So it was also this educational campaign. And that's probably why I lost that, that race, because we didn't make it through half of the streets we were supposed to walk. Um, but but there was a bigger mission behind it. Um, so I, I'm thankful for, for the experience. I'm thankful for everybody that sort of jumped on board. We all learned from it. We all, um, you know, made a bunch of mistakes and hopefully other people benefited from it in the future. Yeah, I, I, I agree, Victor, because I, I remember, um, again, going back to the power structure that was there before us, being invited to all these meetings, like secret meetings where, you know, these leaders in the community thought that we put so much strategy together to, to do this and that we have this master plan on how to run this campaign. Um, and all we had was energy <laughs> and a very eager group of uh, people that really wanted to, to do well, but we had no idea what we were doing. I mean, Victor was the campaign manager, the treasurer, the candidate. I was the campaign manager, the treasurer, you know, the, the person that folds the envelopes. And, they, uh, and, and so then part of what, what really worked uh, was that there was a lot of energy. Uh, Victor was always always willing to talk about vision. And so more people started to come in and, and more people. And Victor mentioned some of those names where uh, we began to learn. Uh, so we lost the first campaign. Okay, fine. But we were almost sure that we knew what we needed to do. All we needed was 13 more votes. And we were going to do it this way and that way. But we really did not have the knowledge of like, you know, running campaigns, we learned along the way. Um, and I think that we really got really excited about what that meant in losing two campaigns and that stopped us. We continued and continued um, until we were able to see, and even the third campaign that we ran we won at the polls, yeah. <laughs> but we lost with mail ballot. Another learning experience. And so, um, Tomas, you, you did a great job, I think, um, really having the, um, the press and the people that were actually writing about this history as it was unfolding, mm -hmm. because to me, it was great to hear their perspective in terms of what they were seeing and what we were going through. And, um, so, you know, hearing people like Charlie Das and, you know, F. Fitzpatrick and Scott McKay, you know, talk a lot about how they were seeing us it was amazing because we did have a lot of energy and we did want to change the world, but we needed to learn along the way because it was not somebody sitting down and saying, okay, it's your turn now, and here's how you do it. The playbook was not given to us. Mm -hmm. And so we missed a couple of things along the way, but we, but we learned. And then finally we won a campaign. Was that Ricardo Patino, Victor? That was a, after Juan Pichardo. Yeah, we won, we won Patino's camp. After Juan lost the first campaign, we won Patino's campaign in Central Falls. Yeah. And, then and came we became back. the machine. <laughs> yeah, we were the tattle the machine. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. And then we came back and that's when Juan won his um, the second time. Yeah. yeah. It, and, it's, you know, it's just been quite a ride. Um, it has. It's and what, what I, I hear, I hear, I hear both of you and it reminds me of, you know, and it's not just a saying, it's a reality that when we are young, there's a lot of things that we don't know but we don't know that we don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's where the eager eagerness and the, every, the energy that the young people have because they don't know. So they only know what they want to achieve. And, but again, so, you know, those two elections were lost. Then uh, two, uh, two or one, you know, uh, 2001 and 2002. And then from there, it, that's when everything started changing. That's when the election 
of uh, Latinos really took off. It was, and, and, and part of it had to do that by then, they, although we were not experts, but we had developed enough knowledge of what needed to be done. And then we started collaborating with among us uh, as Latinos, but in different communities. I remember uh, uh, Victor, and I think Melba, you two, we went to Woonsocket to help uh, individuals up there. And, you know, and pretty much started spreading the knowledge across the state. So, and then with all of that, one of the things that uh, amazed me was that although we were losing, but we were gaining respect. You mentioned him, uh, Mel, but the media, the media, Charlie, you know, Ed, it, they were all writing about what was happening. And that's why I decided to do a segment with them because, you know, uh, I like how uh, Dr. Rodriguez puts it, you know, uh, historians write the history, but it is the journalists who document that history in an everyday basis. And, but again, and with all of that, you both became very respected, highly respected individuals highly respected advisors to not only Latino uh, campaigns, but to many campaigns. So again, the loss and the effort was well worth it. It certainly was, Tomas. And I think it was because, again, you know, we were not looking at it as, you know, this was about us. We were looking at it as this was bigger than us. Same, same lessons that we learned back at URI. You know, Melba went on to run some other campaigns. You know, we got involved with um, a lot of different people. You know, I learned so much from, you know, Miguel Luna, you know, may he rest in peace and, and sort of the work that he was doing and how he was sort of um, bringing a, a whole different level of accountability and, and sort of responsibility for what we needed to do in the community. Um, so we, we had the chance to also, you know, work with some, some great people that, again, helped shape us. And that's why we didn't stop because, again, you know, losing those two, three, four, whatever campaigns we lost, it wasn't about that. We, we knew we had to continue. Um, I always tell, you know, my good friend Juan Pichardo that, you know, he was my campaign manager for two campaigns and, you know, he, he didn't win them. So I don't know. He wasn't such a good campaign manager or something. I don't know what happened <laughs> with him. I know we were. <laughs> but no, no, um, I think I think, you know, just just a story on 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 Juan and the work and how significant it was when, you know, he became um, a state senator. Um, remember that he was also really instrumental in the whole um, fight around redistricting and how we were to redraw lines to make sure that we had maximum representation. And so his um, uh, elections um, were, were also very significant in terms of um, what we did not only here, um, but he was also the campaign manager for Ricardo Patino in Central Falls during that time. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see now everything that's happening in, in Central Falls and Pawtucket and Cranston now getting, you know, more and more uh, people of color to, to run. Um, and so, yeah, you know, Dr. Rodriguez always talked about sort of, um, I think we used to say 10 in 2010. You know, now, now we're, that was 10 candidates in 2010 that we needed to run. And we've surpassed that, right? And people have taken up that responsibility. Young people are uh, defining and redefining, you know, their own work. And so it's great to see what uh, a lot of the folks that are, you know, in the, um, the young people in the millennial groups that are um, really saying, like Melba said, they're saying basta ya. They're saying no more, enough is enough. We also need to make some changes and so the moment in time that we're living is is one that's that's critical um not only for for us but for our families and um our, in our communities and and i think that that's important for us to to look at is that this is not just for the individuals right i think um for all of us it was also a family uh, affair our families had to be willing to be involved give of themselves to do all of this work and so for me you know i mean you guys both know my mom and my brother have been at every single one of these crazy things whatever you know we're doing they're always there so our families were also going along so this wasn't only changing individuals this was changing families this was changing communities 
Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, no, I was just going to say that um, there came a point in which we were still doing politics, uh, but that social justice piece came into, and Miguel obviously was the leader in that, Instead of having us understand you can use politics to make an impact in this fight. You know, social justice, how do we, it, 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 for me, I'm gonna speak for me, Victor, it was a little difficult because it was something new that I needed to understand. I was, you know, as a political science major, I felt like, oh yeah, running elections and, you know, doing this. But I think that was the next step for us. How do we use this as a tool to make change? And then how do we empower new people to ensure that this continues? That's when, you know, we started talking about how to, for me, I started seeing that many women, Tomas, you and I had this conversation, the women were running the campaigns, door knocking. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we empower that? And I had so many conversations with you, Tomas, about yes, what is the best way. I mean, we will have women of all ages, pregnant women, you know, young women, you know, mothers, grandmothers. Um, and that's when we began to really look at created the Latina Leadership Institute to empower them and to begin to say, women, you can also run for office. I mean, I never had the intention. I've been given, you know, the opportunity to fully finance campaign to run and, and that's not my thing. Go Melba, go Melba. <laughs> we cannot all be politicians, there, you know, so uh, really looking into, you know, Dorita Los Santos, Sabina Matos, Carmen Mirabal, and bringing a new group of people that could take take it on and, and you know move forward with uh, with all of that at the same time that um, we were still involved um, and I think um, Juan Pichado mentioned uh, there we we were even looking at that how do we begin to uh, create this black and brown uh, coalition and, and you know working together so some of us were moving towards the social justice part of uh, our community, while others began to continue the politics side of where Victor and I and Juan Pichado and others um, uh, started in the early 90s, mid 90s. Um, and Tomas, I still remember, you know, you kept telling us, I experienced this in Massachusetts. This is what I saw, this is what's coming. And it was like exactly what was happening in that neighborhood. I can't remember the name of it. Raspberry? No. Uh, yes, Raspberry. Yes. Raspberry. And <laughs> you kept talking to us about this happened and that happened. If this happened, this will happen. Yep. And it was almost step by step of what was going on. And here we are, you know. Um, you know, I went on to you know, be the executive director of the Democratic Party. Yes. That's not something that I can say, wow, what an accomplishment. This was just all about what was going on in the community at the time. And as a response to, to that, and I became very good friends with Bill Lynch, uh, but we did have conversations and I say, where did this come from, you know? And it was, they were starting to see that we were uh, the force that was going to be running the Democratic Party and uh, needed to be part of uh, being at the table, basically. So. Exactly. Uh, before we move forward, I just want to say saludos al congresista Adriano Espaillat, que nos está viendo. Ah. <laughs> si es que, y felicidades en su victoria reciente en su reelección. Y saludos a todas las personas que están uh, observándonos por Facebook Live. Definitivamente que lo apreciamos. Y gracias, Tatiano, uh, porque, uh, Víctor, no sé si te acuerdas, nosotros íbamos a Nueva York, a uh, Live Waters, yep. uh, cerramos con esa, esa discoteca <laughs> para recaudar fondos y, y, y de verdad que el congresista jugó un papel muy, muy importante en el apoyo que, que sí. nuestra comunidad y este grupo de jóvenes estábamos experimentando en esos momentos. Sí, sí, no, a, a, congresista, siempre le, le, le agradecemos que 
creyó en nosotros un grupo de jóvenes de, de Rhode Island um, y venía aquí, nos daba el apoyo, nos llevaba a Washington y siempre estuvo apoyándonos. Así que siempre, uh, congresista, eh, eh, mi respeto, mi admiración y mi uh, mil gracias siempre. Ahí tengo una foto que es, eh, interesantemente salió hoy. Es, es eh, el 28 de junio de 1996 y estamos en el Latin Quarter con el hoy congresista Adriano Espallar con un fundraiser para, para Víctor. Así sí, que sí, muchísimas I gracias. I remember <laughs> And it goes back to what we're talking about. But, you know, no, nobody does anything by themselves. You know, it's like this experience is coming and joining. And uh, so as we move forward, and, and I'm glad that you uh, brought uh, social justice, uh, Melba, because I, again, you know, I love history, as you both know. And uh, that's the other part that I remember from both of you. It was that social justice, but most important, you know, your drive to build a relationship, and more than a relationship, you know, a partnership with the African-American uh, community. I remember participating in many dialogues, discussion. Uh, back in 1999, we organized uh, a conference at the Marriott Hotel, and one of the workshops was the black and brown relationship. And, you know, I, and that's what I want to talk about now, because that's, so 20 years ago, we pretty much met And then after that, we all left and everything disappeared. But 20 years after, that is even more important based on what everything that has happened and all the changes that have taken place within those 20 years. You know, uh, as an example, 20 years ago, we were striving to elect Latinos. The African-American community had the elected officials. 20 years after, you know, we have 24 and, you know, and, and I give that as a reference because again, this is a moment of change and social justice doesn't mean just what's happening to the African-American community. It means what happens to every minority, every immigrant. So based on your experience, how do we build that relationship and move it forward? Yeah, I think, Tomas, right now it is a moment in time where we have to be very clear and be very strong in affirming our solidarity with the Black community. We have to be very unequivocally that we stand together with uh, the Black community. This is a time for us um, to, to be able to um, find whatever way we can to make sure that we don't lose this moment in time, that we do not um take advantage of the unfortunate situations um that are happening to sort of say we have to um stand together and we have to support um 100 the the plight of the black community because it is something that um if we don't you know it will be um <clears throat> a shame it will be um something that you know we should not sort of see it as that's a fight that they're having this, a fight that we all need to have together. And so that's what I, I take from this time um, that we're living right now. Um, you mentioned um, earlier, you know, uh, COVID and everything else, but, you know, yes, we are all suffering. Yes, we're all struggling, but right now is a time for us all to stand with, with the black community and be able to say it and be very strong about it. Yeah, I would like to add that, um... 100% agree with you, Victor, but I think we need to understand that what the African American community is experiencing, it's our experience. I mean, mm -hmm. not just as Afro Caribbean or Afro Latinos, but as Latinos in general, we're going back to this either black or white. And if you're not white, you're, you know, you're not in the majority. And so when we understand that this is our future and that we're talking about our children, um, we can't really rely on hues and, you know, I'm a little lighter and you know this, we're all black. Well, what's going on is yes. our fight. 
yeah. and we need to really take this on um, understanding that the impact that it's going to have you know I keep hearing all these buzzwords you know it's not a moment it's a movement it, 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 it's, it has to happen continuously because um, Tomas you keep saying you know your your conversation with um, I don't remember the politician that talked about power and um, knowing the power is not given. Oh, you know, Mar Maxine Waters. Exactly, Maxine Waters. And um, I think our country is at a point in time where it's a struggle for power, right? And um, again, um, people of color may not be perceived as people in, in the more we unite, uh, the stronger that we're going to be against this. Um, and, and, I, and I, you know, and I mean it, it we're all in this together. We can say that the African American community and that we need to support them because we're all in it together. Yeah, yeah Mel, I think that's a, a, a good point to clarify in terms of, you know, also owning our own um, Blackness as a community. And yeah. I think especially, I mean, you and I have had this conversation, especially in the, in the Dominican community, but also all, um, it is it is a, a time for all of us to to own that right now. Um, so thank you for, for saying that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thank you for both for saying that because that, that is something that I, I've been saying, you know, I just like yourself, I'm involved in a lot of uh, communications and exchanges. And that's what I keep saying is, you know, I'm happy to have this to hear a lot more conversations about blackness in our community, Latino community, because like you said, Victor, we have to own it. And you know, and because just like you said, Melba, it's not a it's not a black and white any longer. If you don't look like them, you don't exist. You don't, you know, and you can be used and abused, and you know, we fall into that. <clears throat> So before we end, uh, I, the last, I left this for the last section, education. And you both have mentioned it and you both have played a role in education. Uh, Victor, you are in a key position uh, you know, in the uh, uh, education administration. Uh, Melba, again, because you, it's interesting that both for you, it's like, I, I don't know, you were designed very similar because you have similar path, but the beauty of it that like, you have been able to partner. So we know that changes are coming in education in Rhode Island. Uh, Victor, I still have your speech from 1998, and there's a section there where you specifically talk about education, but most importantly, your reasons why ed education is important, and you, at that point, in that uh, talk about your future children. So where do we go? Where are we going with education? Yeah, Tomas, thank you. And I think that um, you have all heard and, and seen what's happening specifically um, in, in the Providence Public Schools right now, but it's the same for Central Falls, it's the same for Pawtucket, it's the same for um, our students across the state. Um, we have to really um, redefine how we're looking at education in the state. We have for far too long not really invested um, the way that we needed to, not just in terms of dollars, but also in terms of how and who's making the decisions. Um, as you know, I have now the, the, the privilege of working um, at the Rhode Island Department of Education as senior advisor to Commissioner Infante Green, and, and she has been very clear. Um, what's happening is, is it's an atrocity. It's not good enough for our children. We need to do better. We must do better. And we have to find those ways and be very direct um, about the, the work that needs to happen. Um, the status quo is not good enough. The, um, those that, that defend the status quo are complicit with the results and we cannot um, stand by our children. Um, are waiting on us now. Um, that's a great phrase that our, our new superintendent in Providence uh, continues to say, our children are waiting on us. And so, Tomas, I would say that, you know, this is um, a time also for uh, families 
um, parents to demand, to ask more, to push more, to become involved more than ever. Um, I think that there is a, a, um, an opportunity to, to really make a lot of changes. And, um, you know, I know that I belong now to an institution that has been a part of um, what has contributed to where we are today. And so the commission is very clear. We have to also change, um, not just one piece here, one piece here, but it's the entire um, system um, that needs to change. We need to be able to look at not only early education or high school, but we also need to look at higher education. Um, so it is a, a difficult, um, but one that is a must is to focus on what that future of education looks like. Um, you know, you, you, you all know I have now, as I mentioned earlier, um, Luis Francisco is going to be two in August. And already I'm thinking, you know, where am I going to put him in school? You know, that's a question that uh, uh, parents across the state are asking, where am I going to send my child to make sure that they have the best education? And I may have said those words, you know, in 98 Tomas and, and have worked, you know, all these years for it. Um, and now it's right here on my doorstep, right, on a personal level. So both on a professional and a personal level, I have a commitment of we need to um, do better. And, um, you know, every day I wake up and that's my mission, but we have to all make it our mission to improve education in Rhode Island. Yeah, so uh, politics is a great tool to get a lot of things um, done and improve things. Uh, but I think without education, our community would just not be able to move forward. Um, Victor, it must be exciting for you to work now with, uh, with the commissioner because I hear a lot of the things that Diana Lamb and you guys were talking about in Providence again. And it's refreshing to see that those important issues are in the forefront again. Um, and I see a bright future ahead of us. Um, I know the kind of changes and reforms that we need to make takes time, um, but I also believe that it's important to have a leader that understands what the community needs, that understand that we have to work together and that it's so many different stakeholders that need to be part of this. You mentioned it, Victor, parents need to be very, very involved and demand when things are not going the right way. Um, you know, teachers need to be given the resources and also hold them accountable for the performance of our students. Um, and community leaders need to have a voice as well uh, to advocate. Uh, but when I hear things like, you know, buildings do make a difference um, when students go into a place where, you know, it's falling apart, um, too many students in a classroom, um, different students with different abilities, um, and, you know, work-based learning, giving students an opportunity to really experience what is it that is being taught in the classroom so that they can feel it, they can see it. Those are the kind of things that are the forefront right now and that I think um, indicates to me that there is a bright future ahead of us. Uh, but again, um, anyone that's listening right now that is a parent, you have to really get involved. If you're a community activist, and teachers, uh, because you now have a leader that can um, that, that is willing to listen um, and willing to make that as part of the agenda. And uh, before we move forward, I just want to mention that uh, Melba, you mentioned earlier about mentoring. And interestingly enough, uh, for this presentation, most I, I got a lot of messages, but I'll, most of the messages was, "Oh, thank you for." Um, for your, uh, your conversation with my mentors, because you have mentored so many individuals that, so I just wanted to let you know that uh, there's a lot of young people watching, there's a lot of older people watching, but it's because they, you guys play a mentoring role with them. The other thing that I wanna say before we finish, uh, and uh, I remember I had this conversation with Victor uh, over a year ago, is, and that's what I'm hoping 
that these conversations are going to bring. These conversations are not just a one-time thing. What I'm hoping is that it's going to bring us back together because that's how we have succeeded when we come back together and rally together. And I say that because, you know, whether it's parents, uh, whether it's uh, the community, it's no longer about the schools. It's no longer about the teachers. It's not long about the unit. It's about our children. It's about our future. So again, what I'm hoping is that uh, from this, eventually I'll be able to set a network that when Victor needs help or the commissioner needs help or Melbourne needs help in whatever issue, we can come together and rally behind. And I say that because, you know, for I, I saw it, uh, you know, when the co commissioner first came in, you know, it was like there was a lot of attacks, but, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm wrong, but I didn't see some defense uh, from the other. And we need to understand that whether it's Victor Capellan, whether it's Melba de Peña, whether it's the commissioner, you know, they represent us. They are us. They are working for the future of our community and our children. So again, that's part of uh, what I'm hoping that it's gonna go beyond just a conversation, but eventually will it become, you know, just like we did with real time, you know, a machine, but a machine in the positive way of things, just like we did before. So with that, uh, I'll give you your closing remarks and we're gonna end very soon. Thank you, Tomas, uh, for organizing this. Uh, and thank you for thinking of me. Um, I'm not out there a lot, uh, but uh, I still work with many people um, to ensure that our community is growing. Um, and here is to the next 20 years. Um, yeah, thank you, Tomas, for, for organizing this. And a special shout out to Eva, I'm sure she's some um, somewhere near there as always, um, as the producer probably of this of this uh, event. <laughs> so thank you to um, to you and, and Melba. Thanks to you always for um, your your partnering, your friendship, um, not only to me but to my family as well. Um, and yo sé que ya está bien, así que um, quiero dar la gracia a mi mamá Carmen Cookie Tavares okay. <laughs> y a mi hermano Rob. A, a mi esposa Diana, a mi niño Luis Francisco, por el apoyo que ellos también me dan a mí para poder hacer este trabajo. Um, así que muchísimas gracias, Tomás, and, and thank you. Um, we continue to another 20 years. Y saludos a, a Diana Capellán, que está viéndonos también, y a todo, una vez más a todos los que están observando. Muchísimas gracias una vez más, Victor. Thank you very much uh, for accepting and doing this. Uh, again, I'm hoping that uh, a lot more is going to come out of this. Uh, just as a reminder, next uh, week, uh, we're going to be on Wednesday uh, rather than Monday. And uh, next, uh, I'm going to be having what I call Las Tres Presidentas, uh, the three president of the city council, uh, President uh, Maria Rivera from Central Falls, uh, President Sabina Matos from Providence and Susie Alba from Smithfield. And again, is part of uh, this historical account and, and achievements that we have had and is to inform the adults and to educate the future generation. So once again, amigo Victor, amiga Melba de Peña, muchísimas gracias. And everybody else have a good night and hasta la, la vista. Thank you. Thank you.